You know, I've been uh, talking about this whole uh, upside-down kingdom now for a few weeks. Not, not a whole lot long, not, not a long time, but a few weeks. And uh, this teaching that I've been talking about, this upside-down kingdom stuff, uh, is what's known as the Sermon on the Mount. But I want you to think about this. In one teaching, one singular, as far as we can tell, one singular discourse, Jesus covered some very complicated topics, didn't he? I mean, think about it. He talked about who the kingdom, his kingdom, was available to. He talked about the importance of being a witness to a hurting world, what that should look like. He addressed the validity of his own teachings and how his teachings really fulfilled Old Testament law. He addressed the issue of personal motive, issues of reconciliation, adultery, divorce, personal integrity, and dealing with enemies and, and forgiveness. And friends, <laughs> this is just one portion of his teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. And it also appears from what we're reading here, Jesus did this in one single setting. Would you like for me to cover all of that in one single setting? I can do it. I mean, just think about that. I mean, that's amazing. Um, the Josephson Institute, it's a Los Angeles-based ethics institute. It conducted a character study of nearly uh, 80,000 students at 100 randomly selected high schools across the nation. And here's what they found. They found 64% of students said that they had cheated on a test in the past year. 30% had stolen from a store. 42% said that they would lie to save money. 83% said that they had lied to their parents about something significant. And despite their transgressions, 93% of the students surveyed said they were satisfied with their personal ethics and character. With 77% saying, I'm better than most people I know. Now, before those of us who are not students at randomly selected high schools begin feeling perhaps a bit smug, here's a collection of the biggest lies ever told. The check is in the mail. You get this one, I'll pay the next time. Uh, trust me, I'll take care of everything. Of course I love you. It's not the money, it's the principle of the thing. I never watch TV except for PBS. But we could still be good friends. She or he means nothing to me. I'll call you later. I've never done anything like this before. Sorry, we can't come to the phone right now. The truth is, the truth is we are in a moment when telling lies has become normalized. And truth-telling is considered a sign of weakness. But the call of the, this upside-down kingdom on the lives of kingdom citizens, it makes no allowances for, well, everyone else was or is doing it. No allowances for, I just couldn't help it, or rationalizing, lying as a way to get ahead. Kingdom people are to be people of their word, period. Let me, let me just say that again. Kingdom people are to be people of their word, period. Pray with me. And so, God, because we do live in, in a time when it is difficult to just take someone at your word, may we be people of our word, not because of our own strength, not because of our own goodness, but, God, because of your power which resides in us and flows out of us but to the people that we are around every day. Lord, just encourage us from your word. May we find strength in this challenge. We love you and we thank you because it is your example. You, God, are a person of your word. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. So here's what I want you to take home today. Just this, just this. In the upside down this of the kingdom of God, being a person of your word rises or falls on nothing less than how you live your life every day. 
Jesus calls us to something Dallas Willard writes in his book, The Divine Conspiracy. He says this, a life of transparent words and unquenchable love. And in our culture, in our setting, our reality, man, that is upside down living. So in these five verses that we're going to look at, they explain that upside down living, it boils down to two things, consistency and integrity. Consistency and integrity. Here's the first thing. Jesus says, being an upside down kingdom person of your word, it just means keeping your word. Consistency. Again, you have heard it said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you've made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. See, Jesus is making a direct reference in this point to several Old Testament precepts, guidelines, that his listeners, they would have immediately been familiar with. Exodus chapter 20. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless, who misuses his name. Also in Leviticus 19, do not swear falsely by my name and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. In Numbers chapter 30, verse 2, when a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to obligate himself by a pledge, he must not break his word, but must do everything he said. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 21, if you make a vow to the Lord your God, do not be slow to pay it. For the Lord your God will certainly demand it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. So again, Jesus' listeners, they would have immediately been able to kind of get what he was getting at. Jesus is saying very plainly, just do what you say you're going to do. No need to bring God along as some sort of witness to what you're committing to. Just keep your word. And in the first century world of Jesus, making oaths, that was a significant part of life in the first century world. It was how you ultimately got whatever you wanted. And not only that, not only that, the religious leaders and teachers of Jesus' time taught this. Listen very closely. They taught this. The real issue was not taking the Lord's name in vain, but rather taking the name of the Lord in vain. Do you see the difference? See the difference there? It's a slight difference, but there is a difference. Here's what John Stott says about that. He says, the religious leaders conclude that false swearing meant profanity, profane use of the name of the Lord, not perjury, a dishonest pledging of your word. In other words, you can swear and break your promise as long as the name of the Lord is not invoked in your swearing. That's fine. And so Jesus is confronting that head on. And instead of those elaborate rules and formulas, he's simply saying, do what you say you're going to do. Just keep your word. This book I have found to be an incredibly insightful book around the Sermon on the Mount, Divine Conspiracy. This is what I read there. It says, but Jesus goes right to the heart of why people swear oaths. He knew that they do it to impress others with their sincerity and reliability and thus gain acceptance of what they are saying and what they want. It's a method for getting what they want. Does that sound a little bit manipulative? You say one thing just so you can get something from somebody. That's not good. It's very likely that Jesus lived in what we would call an honor-shame culture. Has anybody ever heard that phrase, honor-shame culture? It helps to illustrate so many of the examples that Jesus uses throughout his ministry. In an honor-shame culture, you gain status, your your self-image, your meaning, primarily through how others see you. In an honor-shame culture, one thinks, how does the village see me? Unlike our culture, our culture is 
more focused on what do I think about myself? In an honor-shame culture, social control, uh, folks doing what they say, keeping their word, it's an established norm. Why not? Why is that the case? Why do you think that's the case in an honor-shame culture? Who does it reflect on? Anyone can answer. In an honor-shame culture, when you don't keep your word, who does that look bad for? Not just you, but the family, the village. It makes us all look very questionable. That's a mighty way of, good way of keeping people accountable. It really is. It really, really is. You know, we live in a culture that tells us we can only be ourselves when we claim our right to self-satisfaction, self-fulfillment. But a free self knows that he or she becomes a genuine self by making commitments to other people, promises that he or she intends to keep, even when keeping them exacts a price. Some people ask, who am I? And expect the answer to come from accomplishments. Other people ask, who am I? And expect the answer to come from what other people think about them. A person who dares to make and keep promises discovers who she is by the promises she's made and kept to other people. And that's, that is what Jesus calls kingdom people to do. Be keepers of your word. So in addition to this call for upside down kingdom people to be keepers of their word, people who are living life consistently, Jesus explains in these next two verses that being an upside down kingdom person of your word means living your word. That's about integrity, how you walk every day. Again, read with me from Matthew here in chapter 5. Jesus says, and do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. So what exactly does it mean for your yes to be yes and for your no to be no? What exactly does that mean? Well, this, don't try to manipulate people. By saying yes to something, you really mean what to? No. Don't say no to something when you really mean what? Yes. yes. It's manipulation. You're using people. You're using impressive language to get what you want. And for the sake of clarity, um, I really enjoy, uh, his name is Dr. Henry Cloud. And he's written a book, actually the name of the book, it's called Integrity. It's a great book. This is what he says. He says, when we're talking about integrity, we're talking about being a whole person, an integrated integrity, integrated person with all of our different parts working well and delivering the functions they were designed to deliver. It's about wholeness and effectiveness as people. It's truly running on all cylinders. On the other hand, the unfortunate truth is that, as I've said, we live in a culture that normalizes telling half-truths. It's okay to tell a half-truth as long as what? No one gets hurt, right? This spin doctor stuff, right? You've heard that phrase, spin doctoring, right? And we call those things harmless. Ralph Keyes wrote a book called The Post-Truth Era. That's great. That's a weird title, but it's so accurate. We live in a post-truth era, dishonesty and deception in contemporary life. And he said this, he concludes that some form of deception occurs in nearly two-thirds of all conversations. It's really weird. I'm preaching this message, right? And all of a sudden, I become really aware when I'm talking with someone. I'm getting ready to do this, and I'm like, am I telling this person I'm talking to everything? Is everything I'm saying true? You know, but, but we live in a time when two-thirds of our conversations are filled with some form of deception. And here's the thing. 
nearly every one of us on a regular basis have particular difficult time living this out, right? Except there are a group of people, uh, I, I love studying this history, because there's a group of people who were contemporaries of Jesus. They were called the Essenes. And they were known for lifestyles that were considered somewhat austere. They were strict, somewhat, but not completely like, you folks have heard of the Amish, correct? All right. And the ancient Roman Jewish historian, Josephus, he wrote this. He said about the Essenes, they are eminent for fidelity and are ministers of peace. Whatever they say is also firmer than an oath, but swearing is avoided by them. And they esteem it worse than perjury, for they say that he who cannot be believed without swearing by God is already condemned. Interesting, interesting, because that's the same thing we read in James chapter 5, verse 12. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no, otherwise you will be condemned. Author David Catlahan has made some interesting observations about uh, the issue of lying. Saying one thing, meaning something else. He actually broadened the category of lying to include cheating. And here are some of the examples that he cites. You know, there are many wealthy parents who take their kids diagnosis shopping. Have you ever heard of this? People take their kids diagnosis shopping. They find, they go to multiple doctors until they can find one who will say that their child has a slight learning disability because an official diagnosis of a disability will allow what? More time on tests, the SAT. So a better score gets them into a better college. Personnel officers estimate that nearly 25%, a quarter, of the information on resumes. This isn't true for me though, y'all, so don't have to worry. 25%, can you think, of, think about that? A quarter of the information on resumes that they regularly received is not just padding, it's not just they're making up stuff, it's outright lies. As many as two million Americans, two million, how many people live in the Detroit area? About. About how many people live in the area around Detroit? How many? About seven million. So yeah, almost half the people who live around here have offshore accounts where they keep money hidden uh, from uh, taxes. And this is kind of a funny one. Thousands of Americans, thousands, knowingly pirate cable TV. Six billion dollars a year of cable TV that's pirated. Matthew Keener wrote a commentary in the Gospel of Matthew. He says this, when we lie to cover our own wrong motives from those we think would disdain us, we forget that one day God will expose all the secrets of our heart anyway. Matthew 10, 26 says, so do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. Keener continues, he says this, <laughs> when we lightly commit ourselves to meet people at particular times and then unnecessarily delay them, as if their time were a commodity less precious than our own, we treat them unjustly, deceitfully, even if it's in a relatively minor way. And I love this line from Anna Case Winters regarding what Jesus is calling us to here in this Gospel of Matthew. Love already entails truthfulness. That's what authentic love is. It's truthful. I want to close with this thought for today. I came across this really fascinating piece of history. Like I said, I'm a little bit of a history geek. Um, I love to play like Jeopardy because so much of it relies on history, you know. Um, but it's especially appropriate to kind of wrap up our time with 
this morning, particularly as it relates to being truth tellers. People of our word. People of integrity. Did you know that the Quakers, have, have you ever heard of the Quakers? And I don't mean Quaker Oats. <laughs> have you ever heard of the Quakers? Has anybody heard of the Quakers? They were a Protestant group that kind of rose to prominence, particularly here in uh, colonial America in the 17th century. And they are created, they are credited with creating the price tag. Did you know that? They created the price tag. The story goes something like this, and I checked this out just to make sure that I wasn't going to be telling you guys something that wasn't true. The story goes something like this. Prior to the creation of the price tag, all business dealings were done by haggling. Does anybody know what haggling is? You guys know what that is, right? Yeah. You know, somebody comes to your shop and they want to haggle with you over the price of work that's going to be done, right? You say one thing, they say something, right? They say something different, right? It's basically, we, yeah, you're just arguing back and forth uh, with the seller over the particular price of an item. But what would happen back in the day is that the seller would set a price that was higher than the item was worth. And then the buyer would counter with a lower price. This is laid out in a book that I've been reading called The Good and Beautiful Life. Quakers believed that haggling involved lying. The seller and the buyer would name a price they knew was unfair. Haggling did not sit right in the Quakers' hearts. Thus, Quakers moved to price their goods for what they were worth and refused to haggle. They put a price tag on an item and simply refused to negotiate. This not only saved time, but it drastically cut down on the number of lies that people told every day. The Quakers call this, this is a phrase that you may have heard, they called it plain speech. If you know anything about Quakers, that's an that's a important part of being a Quaker is to use plain speech, which meant speaking without spin or deception. And it looks like plain speech is something that would do many of us, perhaps all of us, a great deal of good. It means living out what Jesus calls his kingdom people to do and be here in the, this portion of the kingdom on the mount. No spin, no deception. Be consistent. Walk the talk. And the upside down kingdom will flourish among all of us. Would you pray with me? God, we live in a time uh, when being a person of your word is a challenge, God. Lord, I'm aware that what Jesus is calling all of us to here, Lord, there are many who would claim that it's impossible, that it's unreasonable, that it's unattainable. But rather, God, I know that we are living in a time and a world that is looking for people who will live this way, not because we're better than everybody, but because you are living in us. And God, we ask that as we become people who engage in the right kind of living, that we don't do it because of, uh, of an idea that somehow we will gain stars on some heavenly chart, but rather we do it because, uh, God, your purpose has always been to have a people who would live amongst your creation, pointing them back to you. May we take this mantle and live it with passion and with excitement and enthusiasm. Not righteous piousness, no, Lord. Humility, uh, knowing that you are doing your good, perfect, and pleasing work and will in and through us. We pray this in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus. Amen.